So, enough of the polls. So, the first thing I want to touch on here is um, in around about 2004 or so, um, 3M um, encouraged our industry to start looking at uh, uh, peak pressure both for helicarbons and inerts, and a project was started. And uh, pretty much every one of the of the major um, manufacturers were included in that study, and uh, <clears throat> it went from 2004 to 2007. And by the time we hit 2006, we're starting to get really good at this. By the time we hit 2007, we r really had it had it going well. Um, 3M had uh, had one of their uh, staff members do his PhD or master's thesis on the enclosure integrity uh, part of it, uh, the whole time part of it, and I handled the peak pressure part of it. And from there, the equations that we're calling the FSSA equations uh, were created. Prior to that, there was a series of tests done, some at Ansel, some Great Lakes, and a whole bunch at Fike on various agents. The, the problem was with all the previous testing is they're all done with the same enclosure leakage, so we couldn't find out how the formula performed over a wide range of enclosure leakages. And uh, in most cases, we just kind of assumed the relationship was a square root relationship because we didn't have a wide enough uh, data set. We found out afterwards that it was not a square root relationship, and that's the reason why most of the peak pressure formulas out there don't work all that well. We based our peak pressure evaluation on what we call the leak to volume ratio, which is um, kind of a surrogate for mass flow rate. Um, it says that uh, you know once you determine the leak to volume ratio for a certain size of enclosure, if you double or triple the size of the enclosure, it performs pretty much exactly the same way. Uh, when you double the enclosure, you put in double the gas, you need double the leakage area, and so on. So um, it was based on what we call leak-to-volume ratio. The leak is measured with a door fan. The volume is just the volume of the flooded enclosure, and uh, it's just as simple as that. Everyone pretty much knows that when we discharge any inert agent, we get a very short positive pressure spike, and it drops off very rapidly as the pressure in the tank goes down. No particular secret there. Uh, the formulas that were being used at the time, which are showed by the dashed lines, there were three of them, and again, all square relationships and so on. And the yellow line is what we discovered uh, from experimental data, which again, uh, you'll notice that it passes the dashed lines in several places, but they are quite different. Um, we did notice that the existing formulas were underpredicting peak pressure by a factor of 200, sometimes even 400 percent. This graph shows the, um, in the orange curve, it's the uh, VDS you know, mass flow rate, um, where the mass flow rate is uh, proportioned evenly. So if we're, um, we got, you know, 600 pounds of agent over 60 seconds, uh, 10 pounds per second. Uh, in fact, there's uh, a peak flow rate or a peak mass flow rate that we use a factor of about 3.9. So when we do that on the blue curve, we notice that it overlaps the black curve, the FSSA curve, at around about the 250 pascal mark. So at 250 pascals, the VDS curve and the FIA curve and the FSSA curves actually produce the same results. There's some other uh, factors in there, but that's primarily the story. So over uh, that pressure and under that pressure, we get quite different results because the exponent that we uncovered doing our experimentation was, again, quite different from the classic square root relationship. Uh, as far as inerts are concerned, the classic uh, graph that you see on the left there of a great big huge spike um, uh, has been uh, altered, I guess, when you use what's called a pressure regulating valve. Instead of just opening wide open and gushing the agent down the pipe as fast as it will go, it regulates the flow, so the flow 
is um, more or less coming out at about the same rate over the entire discharge. And in that case, the peak pressure drops to about half of what it would be normally, and the peak mass flow rate will drop accordingly as well. So our software does give you the ability to add a pressure regulating valve um, anytime you run it. And maybe I can just show you that real quick here. Uh, I'm just going to bring up our software and show you where you can do that. So pressure regulating valves are only for inert agents. Um, currently, pretty much all of the inert agent manufacturers are coming up with some kind of pressure regulating valve and our checks of those valves show us that they all pretty much perform in a similar fashion. So I'm just going to bring up a test here and show you what that looks like. Uh, here we go. I'm just going to drag over our fantastic integrity and you'll notice right here is the point where you can say using a pressure regulating valve and you click on that it will give you the appropriate curve for a pressure regulating valve. So you always have the option of using that in your calculations. I'll just drag that back. Now, people say that I talk too fast on these. Uh, I do have to warn everybody that the last time we ran this, it took two hours. So it's kind of almost like a mini training course and uh, Unfortunately, nowhere near the original one-hour estimate, so I guess you're going to have to be prepared for that. Uh, hopefully, there will be a lot of good information. However, uh, the presentation will be uh, recorded, and hopefully someone's recording it. I know I forgot to record it myself, um, but uh, one of the staff members will be recording this, and uh, we do have previous versions on our website already and we have both NFPA and ISO versions on there, kind of cover pretty much the same topics. This particular presentation, we're going to be focusing a lot more on the pressure venting side of it. So that resource uh, will be available to you. Um, the other resource that we've sent out to you is the Excel spreadsheet and all of the tests, which can be run in fantastic integrity. And I personally spent about five or six hours messing around with those, and I actually learned quite a bit, uh, even though I designed the software. But um, you know, running some you know simulations is a really good way of learning how this uh, process works. So one of my next slide here, uh, as far as halocarbons are concerned, a similar situation. There were very few peak pressure formulas, one which is the dash line. Again, it actually crosses at one point, oddly, on this one agent at 250 pascals. The other agents, it's uh, crossing at different points or not crossing at all. So the kind of peak pressure formulas that we had for halocarbons prior to our four-year study were kind of wrong, I guess. Um, most of the reason why they were wrong, as I mentioned to you before, is the uh, tests weren't performed over a wide range of enclosure leakages. And only by doing that do we find out what the shape of the curve is. Uh, all of the data I looked at that was taken prior to our study was all done at the same leak to volume ratio. So we weren't able to actually establish the shape of the curve, which we now know what that curve looks like. So um, the leak to volume ratio is the prime determinant of um, the peak pressure and in this particular slide we show different leakage rates and in the study what we would do is to vary the leakage of the enclosure and uh, have um, one discharge after another to find out what the peak pressure was. Uh, we're showing a halocarbon here and you'll notice that there's a negative peak pressure pulse at the beginning uh, followed by a positive pressure pulse. The size of the negative pulse is actually uh, determined a lot by the humidity in the enclosure so we had to hold the humidity constant through all of our tests in order to get uh, uh, consistent results and then would vary the humidity to see how the 
a negative pressure spike was affected by humidity. So uh, essentially the, uh, the relationship between peak pressure and leakage is the more leakage you have, the less peak pressure you have. As simple as that. So uh, this is uh, kind of a rough approximation of what our humidity correction uh, showed. Uh, at around 5%, we've got a factor of 1.6, and that drops to 0.4 at 70%. So we can see that uh, there's, you know, four times the peak pressure at the very low humidity uh, versus a very high humidity. So um, humidity is extremely important for helicarbons. It doesn't affect the inert agents much, if any at all. And the reason why it does that is because the halocarbon, when it's uh, discharged, has a very, very rapid temperature drop. Here, in, this, in the span of about five seconds, we drop from 70 degree F down to 45 degrees F. So it's this very, very rapid um, cooling of the enclosure that causes it to inhale, essentially, and start actually sucking air in from the, from the outside. And uh, we've got both Novak and FM200 here, and you'll notice that the that the negative uh, or that the drop in temperature is very similar for both of those agents. Uh, compared to an inert IG55, that's only dropping 13 degrees over, let's say, 60 seconds. The halocarbons are dropping. Uh, 30, what is that, uh, 25 degrees in about five seconds. So it's the rate of temperature drop that's causing the negative pressure pulse. Uh, this particular one, I believe, is a Novak curve, a very short, sharp, uh, you know, negative pressure spike, you know, followed by a bump. Uh, I've concluded that the positive pressure spike is caused as much by the nitrogen blowdown as anything else. Um, once most of the halocarbon is blown out of the tank, there's a head of nitrogen that uh, uh, proceeds after that, and it's kind of like a, a mini inert agent discharge, if you will, and that does cause a slight pe uh, positive pressure spike at the end. And uh, here is HFC 125, uh, similar curve, uh, roughly equal uh, positive and negative spike in, at this particular relative humidity. Um, HFC 125 does tend to have relatively small, both negative and positive pressure spikes compared to some of the other uh, allocarbons. So now we're going to talk about uh, hold time. So I'm just going to quickly take a look at the questions that people have been asking. And looks like uh, not too many questions, so I'm assuming that I'm probably uh, saying the right thing, I guess. Colin, it looks like we do have one question about uh, the NFP. Uh, what section of the NFP 2001 requires peak pressure test? So does it require that? or? Uh, it requires a peak pressure evaluation. I think there's a slide in here which I actually quote the section, which I'll get to later. So the um, NFPA has always used what they call the uh, sharp interface, which says that there is, uh, as the agent leaks out, there's uh, uh, an air layer that forms above and um, an agent layer down below, and the agent stays at the initial concentration and the air is 100% air. We know that there is, uh, you know, some mixing. I don't, I don't think I have the other slide that shows that, but um, ISO says that there is a wide interface that forms and it keeps expanding. We found out in our study that's not quite the case, that uh, there is a little bit of, uh, you know, fuzziness across the interface where it transitions from air and it does have a certain thickness, but the actual thickness is much less than the ISO, uh, you know, standard had predicted. So uh, 
there's some changes that I put through in the 2012 edition where we uh, ran a different procedure and the reason why we changed the test procedure is so we could use the same test procedure to measure uh, hold time and that same procedure would also be used to you know, measure the pressure venting. Since pressure venting occurs at usually over 100 pascals, the leakage of enclosures at higher pressures are often quite different than they are at lower pressures. So it actually uh, helped in both regards. Here we're showing FM200, Novak, and Argon. And um, you'll notice that uh, on this particular test that with the old NFPA standard it failed both the um, hold time requirement and the peak pressure requirement with the new standard it's giving us a slightly longer retention time and I must say a more accurate retention time and a lower peak pressure so both the hold time evaluation is more accurate with the 2012 version and the peak pressure evaluation is much more accurate so we we're able to accomplish both of those goals simultaneously to get much better results um, in both regards. So I, I think that was quite a major uh, improvement and probably the single biggest change that's uh, happened in the standard since it was first issued, I think, in 1985. And I am assuming that everybody is running that version now. So. On the NFPA standard section 5.1.222 says that an estimate of the maximum peak pressure must be done and that there has to be a specified pressure limit. Um, so if you go through the standard you can find these uh, you know, sections that uh, uh, you know, specify those um, peak pressure requirements. There are no peak pressure equations in the standard. Um, all of those are supplied uh, outside, either as we described earlier, the FSSA equations, FIA, VDS, etc. Um, so we're going to be focusing mostly on the FSSA equations here. So now we're going to talk uh, quickly about peak uh, pressure relief design. And um, in the US, we often rely on room leaks. There's a different philosophy in Europe where they don't rely on room leaks at all and they will always install a PRV to relieve the pressure regardless of whether the room leaks or not. Um, we are finding, however, that in a lot of cases when we do the peak pressure evaluation that we do need uh, to install a PRV. Not always, uh, but a lot of the time. And not just for inerts. Um, I would say that probably more than half the um, halocarbon enclosures require a peak pressure vent and they require a very specific kind of peak pressure vent that will vent in both directions and uh, that's not your standard off-the-shelf variety and we do supply vents that will do that. So in peak pressure design, we have to specify the enclosure strength. We need to determine the um, leak to volume ratio that's required. And uh, the estimate of peak pressure is based on the type of agent, whether or not it uses a, re a regulating valve or not, the rate of discharge, and again, the leak to volume ratio. Uh, that's what we use to size the pressure relief vents. So the only table I've ever been able to find, and I can't recall just offhand who did this study, but um, uh, this table shows what you know, various wall constructions are, how much pressure various wall constructions will take. And this is in pounds per square foot. It's about 50 pascals in a pound per square foot. So the values that we have here are actually pretty conservative. So the very first one, a 2 by 4 stud wall at uh, 13 PSF. 13 PSF is about 700 pascals or so and 32 PSF is you know, whatever you know 32 times 47 or 50 or so. So um, the Rule of thumbs that I use uh, for a 2 by 4 wall easily will handle 250 pascals. 
um, which is about 5 PSF, and a 2x6 wall easily handled 500 pascals, 2x8 wall 750 pascals. The enclosure that we tested was um, I think 2x8s and we had it up to around 1500 pascals. In spite of the fact that you, you could see the walls move, we never broke anything. And when you get to reinforced concrete, that they'll easily handle a thousand pascals. So it's important that we use a realistic uh, enclosure pressure limit. Apologize for the spelling mistake in that one. Uh, this is a, a fan system that we evolved, which is actually two of our door fans in series running in opposite directions, uh, but blowing air in the same directions, and it's called the uh, contra mode. And this is the first one that we created. And uh, you can actually bring the room up to the, as much as 500 pascals to prove to somebody that the room will actually hold uh, 500 pascals. In some cases, they want to be conservative. They want to put a 100 pascal limit on it or whatever. And in one case, when they did that, I took it up to 500 pascals. They said, well, it's holding 500 pascals now, so therefore, it should be fine. Um, Uh, the other thing that I uh, really emphasize uh, when we're installing PRVs is to ensure that the PRV actually opens at the specified pressure and gives the amount of leakage area that it's supposed to give. Um, one of our customers on the West Coast here bought a pressure relief vent. I guess it was probably PSI and not Pascal's or something, or maybe PSF. But uh, they installed it, they discharged the uh, inert agent uh, as they would typically do to test it, and they wound up blowing one of the walls out. And they actually did it again, and in that particular application, I think they installed it backwards and again blew another wall out. So after several hundred thousand dollars worth of damage, they decided, hey, why don't we test our PRVs before we install them? That's a good idea. It takes about five minutes. Slap it in a box, turn on your uh, door fan up to, in this case, 125 pascals, and measure the actual leakage of the vent. The other thing we want to see is at what pressure does the vent open? And ideally, if they start opening at 60, 70 pascals, they should be fully open by the time you get to 100 pascals. That allows you to vent the enclosure early and to get more effective uh, venting from the same size of vent. So do two things, find out what the opening pressure is and find out how much actual free vent area the vent provides. And uh, it should also be in, uh, tested again once it's installed and you can simply use the same door fan, you're going to be testing it anyway. Uh, if you're testing a really, really large room with a lot of vents, you can actually install a flex duct and put a box over top of it and check each of the vents separately so that you can use one door fan per vent. Because when these vents are open, it actually takes a fair amount of flow in order to uh, in order to check them. So when you start looking at the large vents, you might run out of flow with your door fan. So that's a way around that. So uh, this is a little representation I made about what happens when you open early. Uh, when you open the vent early, it gives a chance to get some of the flow through the vent before it has a chance to build up pressure. We want to install our pressure vents as high as possible in the enclosure. We have a better chance of venting air, not agent, if we do that. Um, and it's just kind of generally a good idea to keep any extra leaks and a vent even uh, when the vent is closed is going to add a small leak to the room and you want to keep those leaks up to the upper part of the room not the lower part of the room where they'll experience a positive pressure when the agent is on them or when the room is flooded so we want to keep our vents high. We also want to measure them and in this case we're using a door fan to actually measure the um, venting in the room. Now, in order to do that, the first thing we have to do is to see um, what angle the vents will open at. So when we're measuring the leakage of those vents, since we're measuring that leakage between 10 and 50 pascals, we have to hold the vent open in that position in order to, in order to measure the venting path. 
And if you have any confusion about this at all, by all means contact our uh, support at retrotech.com and we can kind of walk you through your first tests. Um, this is a, uh, a picture of a two-way vent that will open in both directions. So for again for halocarbons you'll need to get dual acting vents. And here we are uh, looking essentially at the same curve. Uh, I believe this is also um, Novak. Uh, it's quite common that the pressure vents are installed backwards. In fact, the VDS equations only quote a positive venting pressure, not a negative venting pressure. And here you can see the major pressure spike is actually a negative one. So it's important when you do the evaluation, and particularly if you use the FSSA curves, it will show you what the true uh, you know, negative pressure spike will be and the positive spike. Uh, another option is for existing um, enclosures. Um, often there are isolation dampers in the room that are designed to isolate the enclosure from the rest of the building or the rest of the HVAC system. And in some cases, by changing the damper closing sequence, you can get some free venting essentially by uh, instead of closing the dampers before the agent discharge, close them after the end of the discharge and it's somewhat kind of counterintuitive. Uh, people like to close the uh, enclosure off and then discharge. Uh, during the discharge time, very little of any agent gets lost you know, th across those dampers. And uh, particularly in the case of uh, halocarbons, the room is under a negative pressure for uh, for quite a while, so it's not actually losing any agent at all during the agent discharge. So that's one option to get a free pressure relief vent is you know simply to close the isolation dampers towards the end of the discharge. It wouldn't have to be at the end, but you could start closing the dampers, say after uh, you know ten seconds after the start of the discharge, for example. Uh, I'm here I'm making a point that I've brought up already. It's uh, important when you're checking your dampers to your pressure relief dampers to make sure that when you take them up to 125 pascals or so that they're actually opening as much as you expect them to open. Make sure they open up all the way. They should actually pop open at around about 60, 70, 80 pascals and be 100% open at that point. Um, Pressure regulating dampers tend to open proportionally as the pressure increases and that will give you a larger positive pressure spike and a lot less venting. So we tend to want to find out how much venting we're getting at 125 pascals and that's the value that we use on our formulas. A question. Uh, and question. Um, someone wanted, yeah, there was a question I want to confirm that when you're actually testing your vent in the box that you had on a previous slide, that in order to test it in both um, uh, ways, uh, positive and negative, that you only turn the vent around, or I just want to clarify. Okay. Um, so uh, we've gone back to the slide here when we're testing the vent. We always want to suck air out of the box with our door fan blower. We don't want to blast air into the box, into the box, because the velocity pressure will tend to um, open the vent just due to the mass flow that you're throwing at the vent. So you always want to do it under a negative pressure. In the case of a dual acting vent, we'll depressurize the box, and then instead of turning the fan around, what we do is we take the vent and we turn the vent around since it's supposed to open in both directions, and then depressurize it on the other side. So in this case, we just have a tape to the box. We remove it, turn the vent around, and then we measure the vent in the opposite direction with the fan situated in the box in the same condition. So that was a great question. I forgot that point. Uh, incidentally, we also show the tubing setup here where we've got a blue tube running to the box, in this case minus 125 pascals. We've got the yellow tube which is running to the fan. It's measuring the leakage area, which in this case is in square centimeters and uh, you can actually put this value directly into Fantastic Integrity to get uh, a result if you wish. 
So we'll go back to where we were. So when you do the door fan test of the enclosure, you're doing two door fan tests. One door fan test you're using to discover the hold time. And in that case, you don't want to cover your pressure relief vents, but you want to stop them from moving. The actual pressure during the hold time will only be about four or five, maybe 10 pascals maximum on these vents. So when we measure the leakage of the room, we actually take the room up to 50 pascals, which might be capable of moving your pressure relief vents. So when we measure the uh, enclosure leakage for hold time, we tape the veins of the vent in position so they don't move. We don't want to seal them up. We just want to stop the veins from moving. A couple little pieces of tape is all you need to do that. Uh, so then when we are going to be performing the uh, you know, venting test, if we have a PRV, we want the PRV to be in the open position. So at that point, uh, since we've already done a test of the vent at 125 pascals, we've discovered at what point the veins are open. Now we have to tape the veins open in that position in order to measure the entire venting path. Now the venting path includes the uh, leakage of the enclosure, includes the leakage of the vent, includes the leakage of the duct, if any, uh, to our doors or wherever it leaks to, or to any uh, rain flap that we're showing here that might be accidentally stuck or whatever. So you can actually measure the complete venting path without even seeing the rest of the venting path. And in this case, um, we're checking to see that if there's a flap that's being obstructed, it will show you that. So that's a very important test to do upon first installation and on an annual basis to check to make sure that the venting bath is not blocked. If the venting path is not is blocked in some way, you've lost all your pressure venting. And particularly when enclosures are made especially tight, uh, if you're following the, I guess, the European method of not using room leakage and tightening the room up a lot, then you absolutely have to make certain that these vents are going to open properly. And it's something that needs to be checked on an annual basis. In the case of electronic vents, they also have to be checked on an annual basis to make sure they open. And some facilities, the uh, integrity or the, the structure of the enclosure depends on those vents opening. And um, I recall once doing an underground computer center and they had a series of these vents and I asked them how often they checked them. Uh, to ensure they open prior to discharge and no one had ever even thought of it. So I said, if those vents don't open, you're going to destroy your entire enclosure, probably do more damage than the fire, the smoke event is going to uh, create. So very, very important to, if there's electronic dampers, to ensure that at the appropriate place or at the appropriate time prior to discharge, those vents open up and they allow for venting and then they close down after the discharge is completed. Uh, uh, this is what I call the ceiling vent, an unintentional uh, vent of the ceiling. This can be done in two ways, by the discharge pressure being forced across the ceiling with lots of leaks above the ceiling. It will take the ceiling with it. Uh, it can also be caused by the velocity of the agent uh, discharging horizontally and blowing the ceiling tiles out there as well. It's quite common in the U.S. in particular to clip the ceiling tiles down and, and hope that that will somehow take care of it. Those clips will be on there for a month, six months, whatever, maximum. Anytime someone accesses the above ceiling space, those clips will go flying. So uh, I don't believe it's a good idea to rely on ceiling tile clips to hold them down. There has to be something better than that. This is a, uh, a ceiling vent that uh, uh, can be mounted in, in one of the tiles. So you can see there's a lot of area, two by four foot here. Uh, what this will do is will prefer, it will preserve the suspended ceiling from getting blown out during the discharge. You can also add an egg crate grill. One of the advantages of using one of these vents 
is that it will stop air from flowing down through the ceiling. It will also, if you're discharging agent above the ceiling, it will tend to provide another barrier to the flow of that agent through the enclosure. So these could be a good idea in some designs. Okay, uh, I think the next one we're talking about uh, hold time design and I think at this point we're going to jump over and take a look at um, fantastic integrity and some of the tests that we gave you. So I'm going to drag this over here. and take a look at the spreadsheet that we sent you. And the first one that we have, we've loaded up in here, you can see is number one, ISO 2000 Argon. So um, the ISO 2000 standard and the NFPA 2015 standard are virtually identical, probably within a percent or two of each other. So I say NFPA and ISO 2000 on the spreadsheet, basically going to give the same results. So uh, for those of you who are involved in design, I'm just kind of wrapping up some of the tabs here. For those of you who are involved in design, um, Fantastic Integrity has a great little design tool, which is the very top tab. I'm clicking on that. I say start the venting calculator and it opens up in its own window. Here it is. Let's get rid of that and we're going to take a look at some design considerations. So um, the typical data like the flooded volume, maximum flooded height, lower leak fraction, enclosure pressure limit, etc., are all listed in there. And uh, the first one we've got here is we've got the FSSA formula, we've got NFPA 2001, We've got a 40% concentration. Our spreadsheet shows 45, so we'll just change that to 45. And we've got a minimum protected height of 2.25 meters in this case. Hopefully you can forgive me for using meters. They're just long yards. And we just click on calculate and right away we see that the enclosure needs 6,790 square centimeters in order to uh, give us a hold time of 10 minutes. If that was a smaller value, then the hold time would be longer. But it has to be 6,790 square centimeters total leakage in the enclosure or less to pass our hold time requirement. And you can see that on our spreadsheet over here, the 6790. The um, pressure relief venting area needed is 14,813, so we need another, what, 8,000. The way this is designed is we can decide how much of the existing leakage we're going to use uh, for venting. So in this case, if we decide that we want to use room leaks for venting, we say we're going to use 100% of that. And does a little subtraction for you and says, hey, you need to vent, it's going to be 8,000 uh, square centimeters, which is 0.8 square meters, which is about um, nine square feet. Yeah, about nine square, pretty big vent, but this is a big room. So you're going to need nine square feet of venting in this enclosure. So I'm going to go back to zero here. So hit calculate again, and this is the 14,813. If we decide that we don't want to use the FSSA curves and prefer the FIA curves, we just simply come up here to venting equation. We change that to FIA. Calculate again. Now, FIA requires a peak mass flow rate, and we have a default value in here because we don't know what value you want to use in there, and the FIA uh, Flow calcs will give you a peak mass flow rate, so if you decide you want to use FIA, I suggest you use whatever they are in there, and you don't necessarily have to use our default. Um, our default is what we think it should be, but uh, we you know, certainly don't want to get in the way of uh, FIA calculations if you want to use those. So in this case, uh,
we have 20,322 as the, uh, I'm not sure why this is different. Uh, let's see, that's the same, that's the same. Not sure why FIA is different. It's only different by um, a few square centimeters, but um, in the spreadsheet, we've got 20,371. Here we've got 20,322. And the uh, Enclosure leakage for hold time is going to be the same. If we do, if we use the VDS curves, they use a very similar equation. We click on VDS. Not sure why this keeps wanting to change to 2.3. Calculate again as 20,561. So this is using the NFPA 2001, if we take a look at, in this case, the ISO 2006 version, uh, it requires the minimum protective height to be 90% of the enclosure height, so this has to change to 2.7. Minimum concentration is 35%. So we hit calculate and we want to first of all look at the the FSSA curves will be the same, the peak pressure curves will be the same. What we really want to do here is we want to take a look at the, the whole time calculation. Uh, and in this case we're running 1552 square centimeters. I have a slight difference here. Oh, I see. Initial concentration is 45%. That's what it is. Okay, so we've got 656 square centimeters. So in this case, going from the ISO 2000 version to 2006 version, it's required that the room be four times tighter than it was before. Two contributing factors to that. One is that it requires that the minimum protected height or the protected height be 90% of the enclosure height, so 90% of 3 is 2.7. So um, this fraction of flooded height is 0.9, so that's 90% of enclosure height. It also uses what's called an equivalent height of 2.8, which is the uh, wide interface calculation. And if we close this down, and actually we can't do that because we need to go to a 2000 version. I apologize for that. So if in the 2006 version we actually have a default in there that we can change so that we can run the 2006 version and actually run it as if it's a 2000 version. The reason why that feature is in there is that this enclosure might be have been checked say five years ago, you come back and check it using the 2006 version and you go, oh my god, it requires that the room be four times tighter than it was before, or the 10 minute retention time, in this case with the 2006 version, all of a sudden is a two and a half minute retention time, and a lot of sad faces. That's nothing that we've done, that's just what the standard says, so uh, you have the option of running either one of those standards, and here in this case we're running 2006, and that's just what it is. So while we're on this calculator, we're going to take a look at Novak. So, oh, sorry, this is still Argon. We're going to take a look at Novak. So up here, we're going to change our agent to Novak. And in the software, we will call them all the different names that people use. Uh, we use the NFPA name, we use the manufacturer's name, and they will perform exactly the same way. So FK5-1-12 is the same as Novak 1230, for example. So in this case, we're going to go back to 2000. We won't focus a lot on the 2006 version anymore. So we'll just cover that up to avoid, avoid confusion. We'll focus on the ISO 2000 and the NFPA since they are all virtually identical. Go back to the FSSA equation here, and we're putting in 5.9%, 5 
probably a little bit high for what we typically do in North America. I think we're usually closer to about four and a half percent, but you can put any concentration that you want there. We have a humidity range from 30 to 80 percent. I think the default here might be 80. Uh, this evaluation we're using 60. So we must, when we're using a halocarbon, put the humidity range, which goes in here. Discharge time is 10 seconds. All these other values are the same. The protected height is 2.25, so we change this to 2.25. Do our evaluation, and we come out with, oh my gosh, I have this exactly the same number here. Um, 39.14 square centimeters is required for the hold time. On the positive side, we require 778, so basically uh, the helicarbon is all of a sudden the FIA results and the FSSA results are the same. Why? Because they wisely chose to use the FSSA curves. Um, here, VS is saying that you need 3,919 um, square centimeters on the positive side and nothing on the negative side, and we're totally in conflict with that. Fortunately, in this particular case, since the room has got 3914 square centimeters of leakage, you'll actually get away with it. It's not going to use the vent to vent, it's going to use the room leakage to vent, whether you like it or not. So sometimes you can do the wrong thing and get away with it. However, if we take a look at what happens when we're running the 2006 version, this enclosure is only going to be 875 square centimeters and we're going to need 5462 on the negative side, so this is going to be a problem. Okay, so I think that takes care of that piece. The next one is um, instead of looking at leakage areas, we're going to look at uh, peak pressures. And I'll just kind of expand this out here. Uh, Okay, we'll just do it like that. There we go. So in this case, we're keeping the same um, leakage area. We're saying, okay, we fixed the leakage area at 6790 square centimeters. How much peak pressure will we get if we don't put any vent in at all? FSSA says um, 1169. Uh, FIA says 43.97. This incidentally is argon, by the way. Um, and VDS says 45.11. So you'll notice in this particular case, that there's really a large discrepancy between how much peak pressure the uh, FSSA you know, claims will be created in this enclosure versus uh, FIA. And that's because the FIA and VDS equations work well when the peak pressure is around about 250. Once the peak pressure goes beyond 250, the equation, since they have the wrong exponent, will give wildly different results. And since I've spent four years witnessing the pressures that will be created over a wide range of enclosure leakage, I can say that I've personally verified the FSSA equations uh, absolutely. I've never seen any data uh, on the FIA or VDS equations that evaluate their formulas at pressures other than around about 250 pascals. So I know that the FSS equations are correct based on my personal experience. I can't say anything about the other equations that you might use, whether they might also be equations for manufacturers. I strongly suggest to use the FSS equations because they've been well vetted and everyone in the industry has been involved in that process. Okay, so um, I thought that went pretty well. So we're just going to close this out for the time being and take a look at the next tab of enclosure integrity. So we've gone past the design phase now and we're going to look at um, using the software to create a test. So this is the usual test technician, all that kind of stuff, the equipment that you're using, et cetera. The building and extinguishing details. In this case, we're using one of the same examples that we had before. We're going to get the same results. In this case, we're using argon. 
Uh, we're going for 45% concentration. Um, we have a few more details, elevation, etc., but basically pretty much doing the same kind of thing. So we can now contract that, and the first thing we do is the whole time analysis. In this case, we've done a door fan test. We found out how tight the enclosure is, and we got a predicted hold time of 40 minutes. The moment you see that you've got a hold time well in excess of 10 minutes, you know right away you're probably going to be having a peak pressure problem. So that's one of the warning signs that you'll get. However, we've passed this particular part of the test. We've got a hold time of 40 minutes. We're happy about that. So we're going to close that down, and we're going to start to look at the venting analysis. In this case, we have a gravity vent, so we're going to have uh, more leakage, and that gravity vent is relatively large. It's um, 1.3 square meters, so it's a huge vent, and that vent is what allows us to keep the peak pressure in this enclosure down to in this case 550 pascals using the FSSA curves. In this particular example we're using vent only and we're only venting on the positive side. We can choose whichever equations we want. We want to use FIA equations, we can. If we want to use the VDS equations, we can. So you have complete flexibility to use whatever you want to use. These numbers here and negative results shouldn't be there. There are no negative results. Um, and it's just a little bug on the last version. It's not going to affect anything at all. So this is showing doing probably the simplest peak pressure analysis, which is of a, an inert agent discharge. They're by far the most straightforward. When we come back and we load up the other, we'll just load up another uh, test here. So this is number one. I'm going to go to number three and open that. And you'll notice up here that it says three ISO 2000. So I can pull those tests in. I can view them. Uh, I can send that test file, anybody can read them, uh, very cool, and so on. So we essentially have the same enclosure here exactly. Hold time in this case is 22 minutes because Novex is a bit uh, more dense, and so it tends to run out a bit faster. I think we had more than double the retention time with the inert agent. So we've passed the hold time evaluation. In this case, we jump over to the uh, you know, venting calculation, and uh, in this case, we'll go to the FSSA curves, and here we're using a gravity vent. Now, let's see, what's our agent here? This is Novak. Okay, we're using a gravity vent in the positive and negative direction. Our enclosure pressure limit is 500 pascals, same as before. We're only using the vent in order to relieve that pressure. And that vent area has been entered directly from the test that we've done um, on the enclosure. We can calculate, calculate. So notice we've done an enclosure evaluation on the positive side and also on the negative side. So here, we're running the door fan test in exactly the same way but we're only configuring the vent differently. If the vent opens up more in the negative side than the positive side, then our venting could be different. Could be exactly the same, which is what we have here, but it also could be different. So here we've measured the venting in both directions. We'll calculate those and take a look at our venting analysis in here. It's showing us that we have a positive peak pressure of 444 pascals, negative peak pressure of 3,300 pascals, well in excess of the um, pressure limit that we've applied to the enclosure. So this enclosure needs more venting. So uh, the size of vent that we have in that when we've done our evaluation is, is shown us that we need more venting. And there's a bunch of different options you can do there. One is to say, well, maybe we can use the enclosure leakage as part of the venting. 
in this case, it still probably was not going to be enough. This room needs more venting. So I would uh, encourage you to run the examples we've given you to see if you can get the same results as we have on our spreadsheet. And I'm going to run back to our presentation. So just a, a good point to kind of pause momentarily and ask if there are any questions that are, I seem to have lost my question window somehow, I'm not sure how. Uh, but if there aren't any, we will continue. Extended discharge is one of the options. Um, we can run the whole time evaluation based on descending interface, uh, which we've talked about a lot, based on continuum mixing, which we'll talk about in a minute, or extended discharge, which is very common in, in CO2 discharges. What the extended discharge does is to discover the loss rate in the enclosure and to simply require that you have an extended discharge at the same uh, uh, flow rate as the loss rate so that you are essentially replacing the agent at the top of the enclosure at the same rate as it's flowing out the bottom. And in that way, you can have a hold time that's as long as you want it to be. If you have a 20-minute extended discharge, you're going to have a 20-minute uh, hold time and a little bit at the end where you have essentially um, a sending interface um, hold time which can be added onto the end. But typically for extended discharges, people take a look at the loss rate, they'll have a discharge for uh, 10, 20 minutes and that will be your hold time. In some cases, for really small enclosures, you may, may want to consider reducing the hold time. Uh, for isolated enclosures, we may want to increase the hold time. But for very, very small enclosures where there are, uh, you know, where you have um, operation staff there are 24 hours a day, then you may want to consider reducing that simply because it's very, very difficult to get those enclosures to pass. Passing small enclosures is probably the single most significant problem that people have. And if you have an enclosure the size of a closet and if there's an alarm, the first thing the operator will do is go over to that room and open the door. The moment they open the door, they've destroyed all the enclosure integrity they would ever have in there in the first place. And at that point, they would probably want to handle it with uh, uh, you know, handheld extinguishers or whatever. So that's something you may want to consider. The other thing is to um, measure the lower leak, which uh, in this case we have um, FM200, Novak, and inert agent, and uh, we have 15 square inches with a 12-minute retention time, 11 minutes, and uh, 40 square inches of leakage with 11-minute retention time. If we were to measure the lower leak, as only six square inches in this case with a total leakage of 30, which is twice as much leakage, we can maintain the same hold time because we've now measured the lower leak as being much less than the assumed half of the total. So uh, that's an important consideration to make uh, in these enclosures is that the lower leak really determines the loss rate. And in this case, We've got seven and a half square inches is the assumed leakage in the lower part of the enclosure. Here we measured six in the lower part of the enclosure, and we can actually have more leakage in the upper, upper part of the enclosure and still pass. There's two ways to do that. One is to cover the ceiling in plastic, which allows us to measure the lower leak. The other way is to use this flex duct and to apply a neutralizing pressure across the suspended ceiling. The new gauges that we have with the DM2 and the DM32 have a really cool feature, which is called set to zero. So you can measure the pressure across the suspended ceiling, and you can ask the software or ask the gauge to set the pressure to zero. It balances the room out. All the fans will balance themselves, and you can get a reading very quickly. What we used to do in the old days is have two people, one that was adjusting the fan, the other was putting smoke across the tiles, and and determining whether the smoke was moving up or down. This is a much better and faster system and requires only one person. Uh, 
that's another picture of the same thing. And it's showing the, the software doing a 50-50 leakage split, uh, doing the whole room test and getting 5.1 minutes, doing the BCLA test, measuring the lower leaks, and giving 11 minutes. It's necessary that when you do this, you measure the total leaks, put that value in, then measure the lower leaks and enter them as lower leaks. It's not acceptable to measure the lower leaks and call them total leaks. You have to measure the total leaks, then measure the lower leaks separately. And the software facilitates that very easily. And the final test procedure would be the subfloor only test, which even though it's not really fully compliant with the standard is something that happens quite a bit. And here we've we use a plastic material to cover up the open registers. We've neutralized the pressure across the subfloor. We have a whole subfloor test procedure in our manual and also in our training course on level three. So uh, just touching on uh, continuous mixing, I would say that probably around half the enclosures out there are continuous mixing, whether you want them to be or not. Often they'll keep one of the air conditioning units blowing into the floor definitely will give you continuous mixing. One of the advantages of continuous mixing is that it gives you um, the same protection throughout the enclosure. One of the disadvantages is that it requires a higher initial concentration than you would normally use for descending interface. So the criteria for continuous mixing becomes the difference between the initial concentration and the minimum, whereas for descending interface it's the top of the enclosure to the minimum protected height. So we do need uh, extra agent whenever we have a continuous mixing situation. And here we show continuous mixing test and we're showing the difference between descending interface giving only 5.1 minutes. We go to continuum mixing and we've got 13.9 minutes. So uh, AC units circulating or a circulating fan, which I've actually never seen before, but is theoretically possible. I usually see more of this type of thing, is uh, what I see for mixing, just keeping the HVC running. So I, I'm sure that most of you uh, have gone through our online training course. Uh, we have roughly about 3,000 testers that have completed this, and it's pretty accepted um, you know, training that uh, is accepted in about 50 or 60 countries and so on. So uh, this is a very good way to uh, get qualified for this. This particular slide shows how when we're testing an enclosure with a door fan from 10 to 50 pascals, that we are able to determine the slope of this curve. So we only measured at 10 pascals, which is what we did in the, the old versions. Then we would say, well, the leakage is 257 square centimeters. If we measure at 10 and 50, we uncover the slope of this curve and we find it a high. At 125 pascals, we actually have 443 square centimeters, which is almost double. So this really improves the situation and will allow you to more accurately determine the size of your PRVs. So it's important when you're doing the enclosure evaluation that you do this uh, multiple point test for at 10 to 50 pascals to get that advantage. It also gives you much more accurate results at lower pressures, uh, which is what you're going to get during the whole time. OK, I've already done this. Um, this is another representation here. Uh, in this case, we've done a multi-point test. We've measured the leakage at 10 and 50 pascals. And at 10 pascals, they both say you have 13,000 square centimeters. But w when we do the multi-point test, it shows us we have 18,000 square centimeters at 125 pascals, which is where we evaluate our venting. And it also gives us a much more accurate prediction of our peak pressure in this case. This slide shows that both chemical agents and uh, inert agents need venting and they certainly need an evaluation. Uh, here we've got uh, 
argon requiring um, uh, or I'm sorry we've got argon giving us uh, 1169 uh, Pascal's peak pressure but on the negative side we've got uh, Novak giving us 708 not quite as much over here but I would say that when we're using the pressure regulating valves this 1100 uh, pascals will drop to around 600 so we'll find when we're using pressure regulating valves that the halocarbons and the inerts will start to give roughly the same peak pressures in the more or less the same enclosure so uh, for those of you familiar with our equipment we've got a whole new line of what we call 5,000 6,000 fans and so on or every part is injection molded much more accurate than they used to be um, we have the 4,000 fan, the contra fan, which will take rooms up to very, very high pressures and high flow rates. Uh, and I think at this point, we've got one more poll here that's going to find out what kind of stuff you need from us to help you. What would you like? So I'm going to launch that poll right now great time to ask questions which unfortunately I can't see so if you can uh, respond to our poll I'd much appreciate it I have no idea where my questions went your questions may be behind your uh, the window that you have in front of you so if you move some of your windows out of the way you might find it on the back side uh, let everybody know that we also have Paul Coxon coming up here in just a minute to give a brief overview about some of the uh, the venting options and some of the, the the details that we didn't get to go into. Yeah, I'm assuming that our tech support staff will be. I still haven't been able to find my questions. I don't know where they went. Uh, I pressed the X instead of the minus, so I, I think that that was a bad thing. Okay, so a little over half of you have responded. That's great. Um, the response to this particular question will be in the Excel spreadsheet we get, so we will go through that and send you whatever information that you've asked for. Uh, in the handouts, we've got a whole heap of things that we've thrown in there. Uh, papers I've written on for ISO, NFPA, uh, and will probably answer 90% of the questions that you have. I've also put another copy of our example spreadsheet, which I've pretty much sent to everybody that signed up for this uh, webinar. And I see we've still got just about everybody still uh, online. Very few people have bailed on us. I appreciate that. Okay, so Joe, can we keep the poll open while we start up on Paul's presentation, or do we have to leave no, that it's up? Not possible. I'm going to go ahead and close it and show everybody the results. Okay, I, I don't think they probably care all that much what kind of information people want, but if you want to show it, I guess that's okay. All right, we can go ahead and uh, bring Paul in. Okay. <laughs> Paul Hi, Paul. Hi. I need to try and share the screen. You're up. You're up See now, Paul. This... Okay. Let me pull my screen up. Can people see my screen? Yeah, Paul. Do you want to introduce yourself briefly, just just uh, so people know where you're coming from? Yes, certainly, certainly. My name's Paul Cox, and the company's Air Pressure Solutions. Um, we work very closely and have for many, many years with Retrotech and Colin Genge and his colleagues. Um, my background is fire suppression. I've been in the industry for 25 years, and in the uh, I launched Energen in the UK in uh, in uh, 1992. And in 1993, I started learning an awful lot about pressure relief venting. When uh, we lifted a number of ceilings, blew a number of walls over, and uh, had a had a very interesting year. Um, I then got into starting to look at pressure relief venting, and uh, uh, and then in the Halon uh, changeout period in the early uh, uh, 2000s, um, got involved with uh, developing and manufacturing ranges of pressure relief fence. And I'm probably on uh, variant uh, six 
uh, now from starting with gravity vents onto, uh, uh, onto balanced weighted vents. So we work in a number of areas. Uh, one of our main areas is pressure relief venting. Um, we also use that venting technology um, for um, blast venting more in the um, power generation market for arc blasts, which create a similar uh, peak pressure curve to, uh, to inert gases, unregulated inert gases. Um, we've also, over the years, got involved with smoke control systems, pressurized stairwells, um, gas extract systems. Um, and we now also manufacture um, a, a range of European approved fire dampers, um, which we started to look into for closing unclosable openings in uh, in fire suppression systems, um, but now have, uh, have moved into the wider market uh, with those. Um, part of our, 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 our services that we provide, not just in the UK but worldwide, um, is design. In 2008, sort of following what Colin was doing with testing um, in the States, we did a series of um, third party verified live discharge tests, mainly on inert gases. Um, with some very small tests on, uh, on chemical agents, on FM200. Um, but we specifically moved into looking at cascade venting, um, which is an area where if you have a, a, a data hall or, or, or a, a comms room within a, uh, an office building, maybe a multi-story building, and that might be in the center of the building, um, it, it can be very difficult to disperse that uh, pressure, um, certainly from an inert gas system. Uh, through that building um, to atmosphere. And most of the standards uh, suggest that uh, ideally you want to be venting directly to atmosphere, not through sub areas. Um, but in some cases there is no alternative. And through our tests, uh, the, the testing we did back in 2008, um, and some subsequent testing on large systems that have failed and we've redesigned and then retested in live discharge testing. Um, cascade scenarios have proved that the theory that we created through our testing um, actually works in, in live systems. So it's quite an area that, that, that we give a lot of support to, uh, to our customer base. Um, that also links into the consultancy service, which has tended to be more um, looking at issues where um, systems have failed. The walls have been blown over, ceilings have been lifted, and over the last uh, five years, certainly, um, we've probably looked at about 10 systems around the UK and Europe um, where they are systems that have been vented um, but the structure has failed um, due to the venting systems not being designed correctly. And that's on inert gas and we've investigated one or two FM200 systems doing the same. Um, but we're a very open company and we also look at uh, training and giving people the, uh, the knowledge um, in conjunction with Retrotech um, on how to design these systems, um, but also looking at, as Colin did, uh, mentioned earlier, um, structural issues within a building. Um, some of the data out in, in, uh, in the marketplace um, is based on tests that have been done for hurricane storms in, uh, in the States. And you can have data on a, a piece of material on a, on a, 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 a stop partition wall that might suggest it meets a certain pressure rating but the weakest part of a building is the interfaces between, say, a wall and a ceiling, or the glazing, or the door. So there's a lot of areas there that we uh, we, we help support uh, and look at, and have done a lot of testing on. Um, my experience, as I mentioned, is, is the background in uh, in fire suppression. So we've developed our pressure venting, unlike any other company, um, on specifically working with fire suppression system, so looking at uh, peak pressure under live discharge. One issue that is very important um, and isn't necessarily tested by putting a pressure vent on a fan, it is a little bit more with the, uh, the Retrotech way of using a negative pressure on a pressure vent, um, is looking at the resistance that pressure vent has to opening pressure. And this is mainly uh, uh, required with inert gases because an FM200 discharge, for example, uh, negative and positive peak pressures are much hit the pressure vent in a much more gentle way. So the pressure vent will slowly open, whereas with a, an inert gas, you're hit going from naught to potentially 55,000 pascals if the room was hermetically sealed, um, within about 0.25 to 0.5 of a second, depending on, on the system. 
Um, even with a regulated valve, you will still get reasonably high pressures. One thing Colin uh, mentioned earlier with his tests is the difference between peak pressures um, with, the uh, with the calculations between FIA and FSSA and the, the figures he did. The worst case I ever had was in, in our 2008 testing. We had a, a we were testing in a steel shipping container and uh, with almost no leakage, with the doors closed, and when I was in the risk, we hit uh, 2,900 pascals of positive pressure which does suggest that uh, the work that Colin's done um, does mean that the pressures aren't as high as we would expect. But um, some tests were done in, uh, in France some years ago um, where they tested particular items and we found that 12-inch uh, reinforced concrete um, was breaking at about three to three and a half thousand pascals um, and untoughened glass was breaking at 300 pascals. So, there's quite a range of, of pressures that, that, that can be used. But we'll do a, we do a lot of background and a lot of uh, support in that field. With our products, um, apart from a leak detection product that we provide, we buy in from the States, most of our, or all of our equipment is manufactured by ourselves in the UK. Um, and we are looking with our pressure vent products to set up manufacturing uh, in, in the States uh, and other parts of the world um, to support our, distribu our distribution network. We do a PV pressure vent and a PVD. The PV just means pressure vent. It's a one-way inert gas pressure vent. And the PVD is a pressure vent that's a dual flow. Um, we've designed our latest version to give a free vent air of up to 90%. And I talked uh, talk about on this uh, a dynamic coefficient. The other way of looking at that is this resistance to opening pressure. Um, where without a pressure vent, you might get a certain peak pressure within the room. You put a pressure vent in that hole. Um, and you will get an increase in, pre in peak pressure within that room. The difference is the dynamic coefficient, which we use, and uh, I haven't found any other company uh, that, that, that has tested to find out what theirs is. Uh, we've tested some other products to, to see what they are, so we do have a good understanding of that. Um, some of the key areas is uh, fire ratings. Uh, we have UL fire rating for two hours, and we have European fire testing up to four hours on our products, and we have quite a wide range of uh, of sizes. Um, we've moved over in recent years to a solid welded construction. We found with some pressure vents, especially two-way pressure vents, where the tolerances um, between the blades and the casings are very small to keep leakage to a minimum. Um, if there's any movement in that casing or it's pushed into a hole that hasn't been cut correctly um, or it's dropped, it could, uh, could get blades that stick. With our solid welded construction, that no longer occurs. And for installation purposes, once the hole is cut, um, it's about a, a 15 to, to, to 30 minute install. Um, and we provide wall sleeves to, to fill in the, uh, the gaps if you have a cavity wall or openings within that wall. I mentioned 90% free vent area. Um, the standard range that we supply off the shelf is starts with our basic letterbox type pressure vent, which we call the PV150, which is 300 mil wide by 150 high the internal open area, right up to a, a thousand by thousand um, millimeter um, pressure vent. So we can cover pretty much every, every scenario. Unlike some manufacturers, we've designed special external louver devices that do not restrict the free vent area of the pressure vent when it's going into an external wall. But also um, when, they, uh, uh, when they're in the non-pressurized position, um, also create a good wind and, and thermal barrier um, to, the, uh, to the internal of the building. Our two-way pressure vent does the same. We provide a unit where the blade opens fully in both directions. Um, so you don't need to worry about uh, the positive or negative pressure. You take the biggest um, pressure element of your calculation, size that pressure vent to that size, and any other variant will uh, uh, Will, will be covered. Um, one of the things we, we look at on room integrity is uh, all pressure vents when they are installed into an enclosure um, create have a certain amount of leakage. A pressure vent is a free moving balance weighted unit. Um, so although we try to keep the leakage to a minimum, um, there is some additional leakage to the room which needs to form be formed into the calculation when you're uh, when you're testing. Um, 
what we've found over the years is I have never had a room fail an integrity test because of the leakage of the pressure vent. It's a very small amount of leakage, um, and we have a lot of test data on this. Um, we sometimes get customers turning around and saying, uh, when we cover the pressure vent over, um, we get a 10 minute hold time. When we don't, we're getting 9.5. Um, what we tend to find there is that there are holes and uh, integrity that hasn't been, uh, hasn't been sealed up properly within the room. Um, and once a, a, a company that understands room sealing uh, is involved, um, there never is a problem. One thing that we did some years ago um, is try to combine, in fact we do very, very well, we combine pressure venting with gas extract. Um, in some countries, uh, and certainly in the standards, they talk about having some form of dedicated extract. Um, and we do two variants. We do a pressure vent with a fan on the back of it that can go into an external wall or can be ducted off the back for inert gases. And then we do a unit that can sit on the floor or in a floor void um, for chemical gases. And the difference really with gas extract is that inert gases being similar density to air um, can be extracted from high level. You don't have to have low level extract, whereas chemical gases, um, which are generally much heavier than air, um, need to be extracted from low level. So we cover that, and the fire ratings are also included with that. And we provide those in a kit form, so it's very, very simple to, uh, to include um, in your sale um, gas extract or combined pressure vent extract systems. Talk about fire testing. Last year we achieved UL555 fire testing for two hours. That was carried out in stud partition walls. Um, and the uh, EN standards for Europe um, we've done for two hours and four hours, depending on the structure, in stud partition walls and in, uh, in block work walls. Um, discharge testing has been verified on a number of occasions by third parties. Um, move on quickly to blast venting, knowing that we're running out of time here. Um, we provide, um, not just for blast venting, but also for pressure venting, motorized pressure vents. Um, for example, if you're pressure venting a room and the customer is trying to keep the number of penetrations in that room to a minimum, uh, we can use the existing air conditioning ductwork as long as it can be shut off and given a path to atmosphere. By installing fire rated motorized pressure vents, this means that the pressure vent can be motored to open in, a, in the open position all the time in normal application to allow airflow. But in a, on a fire signal, the motor will close the pressure vent and then the pressure vent linkage will allow the blades to open freely as a pressure vent. Um, this has not been moved into blast venting and uh, a couple of the pictures I show on this slide are of some pressure vent louvers that we designed for some substations um, uh, around the UK um, that are open normally for ventilation to keep the temperature down in the substations but on activation of a fire alarm they will spring they will uh, spring closed um, to allow fire suppression to be discharged into the uh, substations um, but if there was a blast or overpressure caused by the uh, suppression system they will open they will spring open to relieve that pressure and snap closed again if there was a blast um, they would open fully to relieve that blast and then close again. So we've done a lot of work and, and come up with formulas and calculations to um, design pressure venting for um, arc blasts. That's when you get a large arc from power generation. Smoke control, I know it's a very different area, but we get heavily involved in that, in looking at pressurized stairwells and basically removing the, the risk of smoke from escape routes and uh, stairwells within all forms of, uh, of, of buildings. So it's just another area that uh, uh, we work in. And finally, fire dampers. Um, we supply them, as I mentioned, we started to supply them to allow the fire industry to install them, or we will install them in the UK, uh, on unclosable openings to close off the ductwork coming into data centers to give room integrity. Um, and we've moved that out into the into the wider market. So it's just another line we, we, we offer to our client base um, to help them uh, uh, provide their customers with the service that's, uh, that's wanted. So that's uh, a quick uh, overview of what we do uh, in conjunction working very closely with Retrotech and Colin Genge, and I hope that, uh, that was of some use to you. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Paul. That was great. Um, so 
we uh, don't have a backlog of questions. We've been able to answer all the ones that have been thrown our way. So we uh, encourage you to stay on the line as long as you want and fire questions at us at random. We've got uh, four or five people here ready to answer them. So uh, uh, pretty much anything, comments even, you know, was useful, not useful. Um, something that we didn't cover that you would like us to cover. I uh, would be happy to answer whatever you want to throw our way. And if we don't get any questions, we're going to call it a day. So we're at about the one and a half hour mark. So we managed to proceed along a little bit faster than we did last time. I guess experience counts. Okay, venting information was helpful. Thank you very much, Al. Um, question asked about um, how we can get further information on vents. You can contact uh, Paul directly or support at retrotech.com and we'd be happy to provide you with whatever information you need. A um, uh, question by Joseph saying, uh, Paul you can answer this, what's the difference between a smoke damper and a fire damper? The difference, a fire damper generally is a fusible link damper. It's non-motorized and it will snap shut on heat um, to create a fire barrier. but won't necessarily stop smoke passing through it. It will stop flame and heat. Whereas a smoke damper is generally motorized, so it's triggered via the fire alarm system um, on detection of a smoke, of smoke, uh, and then will spring closed and provide a higher level of seal so that flame, heat, and smoke uh, cannot pass through it. So the fundamental difference is one is motorized, a smoke damper is motorized, um, and a fire damper is non-motorized. Okay, uh, great, thanks Paul. Um, if someone wants to contact you, they can simply uh, just ask support at retrotech.com. I don't think I have your contact details on any of the slides here. Uh, let me just take a look here. No, I must admit I didn't put them on. Okay, <laughs> so I can stop looking then. <laughs> uh, but certainly just, uh, you know, send a message to support at retrotech.com and we can either provide you the information or put you in touch with Paul. Um, so our, our friends in uh, the Middle East are saying, uh, to you know, promote again that we're going to be at, uh, that they're going to be at Intersec. Um, I think that's uh, coming up, uh, just kind of bump all the way to the beginning of this whole presentation here. Boy, we sure covered a lot of slides. So Intersec again is January 7th to the 18th in Dubai, UAE. Um, so by all means, um, I, I believe at the last Intersect show it was virtually a lineup to talk to our reps there and play with all of our stuff. So both our door fan equipment and pressure vents will all be on display there. So you can uh, go and kick some tires. Neil Bolton from uh, from Air Pressure Solutions will also be there as well. Oh, tremendous! So uh, you can talk to the pressure venting guy in person. Good to know. Now, uh, a question um, by David uh, asking, will peak pressure affect the hold time? Um, they're not directly related. They are related and, you know, from the simple point of view that the hole in the enclosure affects the hold time, the hole in the enclosure affects the peak pressure. But um, a large pressure spike doesn't really affect the hold time much at all. So. If you have a 100 pascal pressure spike, a 1,000 pascal pressure spike, it's not that that pressure somehow changes anything to do with the, the whole time. There's actually very little uh, agent is lost in most cases uh, during these discharges. I find that typically the NFPA and ISO equations allow for a loss rate, particularly with the inerts, of if it's a if it's a 5% concentration you're discharging, it kind of allows that you're going to lose 5% of your agent. I find you lose almost nothing at all because of the contraction 
uh, it's not blowing out of the enclosure when you discharge is actually sucking in so you wind up with actually more mass in the enclosure than you're supposed to mostly due to the fact that you're cooling so as you're discharging mass you think ah the agent is leaving but it's not because it's contracting and it's contracting to a smaller volume than what you're adding so um, I don't know if that answers your question or not um, there's a question about providing CUs for this test I think at one time we had nice set credits I don't know if we do or not uh, if that's something that we do then um, you can contact support on that particular issue or support will actually contact everybody in the presentation and say hey we have nice set credits available so you get them and if we don't then um, then there won't be any uh, the only other question I saw was uh, Colin, can you kind of explain you the process of uh, only measuring the lower leakage um, and the higher leakage? You had a slide that shows the two fans, and I think some people were uh, misunderstood about how you need two two manometers, or can I do that with one fan, or other questions that kind of came by earlier. Can you bring that slide up and explain how you measure the lower leakage only? Okay, I'll see if I can uh, see if I can find that one in here. I'm gonna blast through this. So whenever we do one of these enclosure tests, we always start uh, by measuring the whole room leakage. Uh, hopefully I'll find that before I run out of, oh, here we go. So we measure the whole room leakage. We will are forced by the software to divide whatever we measured in half and say half the holes in the floor, half the holes in the ceiling. Typically, it's, the split is usually about 30-70, but we apply the worst case formula because we don't know how big the hole in the floor is. And if we happen to fail, we say, aha, well, how about if we measure the actual lower leakage? And with this slide that's up on the screen, it shows how we measure that. So we have a second fan that's depressurizing the above ceiling space so that all the upper leaks are handled by this fan and it's not measuring anything. The lower fan in this picture is measuring the lower leaks only and how we determine that the upper fan is not stealing any air from the lower fan is by making sure the pressure across the suspended ceiling is zero. So in that way the lower leakage fan or this fan we have down the bottom part of the panel here is actually measuring the lower leak. And uh, let's say for example the total leakage is 300 square inches and we do the below ceiling leakage area test it might measure say let's say 50 square inches that will give you about a two and a half times longer retention time than your initial calculation so um, all of our fans come in a gauge and a fan combination the fan on the bottom is measuring the room leakage the fan on the top is being controlled by a set to zero function on the fan there's an amazing uh, section in our training course on level three that goes through all this in detail, shows you a live test and so on. And I recommend everybody take the you know, level three training uh, in order to learn how to do that. Uh, does that sound like uh, that was that a decent explanation, Joe? 